As part of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln system, the Haskell Ag Lab serves as an important asset to the communities of Northeast Nebraska. The Haskell Ag Lab, which sits east of Concord, started in 1957 as a research farm to serve the ag industry. Today, it houses researchers and technologists, as well as the Dixon County Extension Office. The Haskell Ag Lab has hosted annual VIP tours, but for the past three years, this has transitioned into a family field day inviting families, farmers, and ag enthusiasts out to learn more about what the lab has to offer. Unfortunately, due to circumstances surrounding COVID-19, this year's field day has been moved to a virtual format. We are excited to bring you a sample of what is currently happening at the lab. This in no way showcases the extent of the programs and projects going on, so we encourage you to reach out to ask questions and get to know the faculty and staff here at the Haskell Ag Lab. Well, thank you for the invitation to join you today. It's definitely an exciting time for the College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources. We have several strategic priorities underway, including transforming graduate education, and a focus on holistic student development by linking curricular programming with experiential learning, co-curricular opportunities, inclusive excellence, and student health and well-being. We are also partnering with Nebraska Extension to serve the continuum of learners in Nebraska. The creation of the Northeast Nebraska Agriculture and Natural Resources Education Compact is an example of our focus on the continuum of learners. This compact is the first of its kind for Nebraska. The compact combines the strengths of the partner institutions in the region to meet the diverse education needs of youth and lifelong learners and contribute to workforce and talent development to support economic growth strategies in agriculture and natural resources. This initiative aligns with state and national priorities of improving college and career readiness, education attainment, in community and economic vitality and growth, as well as the end 2025 strategic plan for the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the Lumina Foundation's goal to increase degree certificates and other post-secondary high quality credentials from a national average of 48.2% to 60% by 2025. The Education Compact partners for this initiative include Little Priest Tribal College, Nebraska Community College Association, Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture, or NCTA, Nebraska Indian Community College, Northeast Community College, Wayne Community Schools, Wayne State College, and the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources, with representation from Nebraska Extension and CASNR. Here's an example of where we think about the Haskell Ag Lab and how important of a role it can play as an engagement center for that continuum of learners. Um, we are excited to grow our partnership programming in Northeast Nebraska and expand the compact model to other parts of the state. Thank you for your time and your attention today. And if you have any follow-up questions on the Northeast Nebraska Education Compact, don't hesitate um, to reach out to me. Again, Tiffany Hang Moss, Dean for the College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And my email address is T-H-E-N-G-M-O-S-S-2 at unl.edu. And again, thanks for letting me be a part of today's field day. Hello, I'm Steve Rasmussen. I'm with the Nebraska Forest Service, which is part of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'm a district forester and also the curator for the Northeast Arboretum here at the Askell Ag Lab. Today, I'm going to give you a quick introductory virtual tour of the Arboretum so that you can see what type of plants we have growing here and encourage you to come back and visit. The Northeast Arboretum is an affiliate site of the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. The Nebraska Statewide Arboretum is a statewide system of affiliated sites across the state to represent different climates. You can find out more about Nebraska Statewide Arboretum by visiting plantnebraska.org or Google search Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. The first unique tree I want to show you here at the Northeast Arboretum is the Don Redwood. The unique thing about this tree is it is a deciduous conifer. It'll drop its needles in the fall, it'll turn a bright yellow color, and drop off after about two weeks, and then in the spring it'll leaf out with real light lime green colored needles. 
The next tree we have to show is the Cannon fir. This is a variety of uh, balsam fir. It's found in a valley in West Virginia, is how it gets its name. I chose this tree to represent the over 14 different types of true conifers that we have growing here at the Arboretum. It has very fragrant uh, needles and branches. So when I'm out here working at the Arboretum, at the end of the day, sometimes I'll take a small clippings off the tree, crush it up, take it with me in the truck, and I have my automatic immediate air freshener. The next plant I have to show here at the Northeast Arboretum isn't a tree. I decided to throw in a shrub in this virtual tour because we have a number of different shrubs represented here. Uh, the neat thing about this uh, shrub that I like the most though is the um, buttons that are produced is how it gets its name button bush. Uh, if you can see the buttons on the shrub in the back and this button here it's real um, fluffy and almost the size of a ping pong ball. So it makes me think of the little uh, trees that are in the um, story of, of the uh, Lorax where they've got the little puffy balls on them. The next tree we have to show you is the persimmon tree. I chose the persimmon tree to represent the fruit tree collection that we have here at the Haskell Ag Lab. We have about 18 to 20 different types of fruit trees showcased. Uh, apples, pears, cherries, peaches, apricots, and also the more unique uh, tree like persimmon to show the different types of uh, fruits that can be grown in this area and you can utilize in the fall. Another unique tree we have here at the Northeast Arboretum located east of the Haskell Ag Lab is the chestnut trees. And we have horse chestnut, um, Chinese chestnut, American chestnut, uh, different types, but the one I wanted to show today is the Chinese chestnut because this tree gets a very good edible uh, nut meat that you can either roast or you can chop up and use in dressings uh, in the fall and any type of cooking um, uses like that. The tree as it's growing in the spring and summer will produce husks. Here are some tiny husks just getting started, middle of July. They're about the size of a, of a large marble, but by the end of the summer they'll produce a, a sharp spiny husk, uh, similar to a large walnut, but instead of having a smooth, mushy, green or black shell of a walnut, it'll be spiny. I've had some uh, kindergartners, when I show them this, describe them as porcupine eggs, which is a pretty good description. The next tree we have on our virtual tour of the Northeast Arboretum is the ginkgo. Uh, this tree is unusual, like the Don Redwood. It's considered a living fossil. At one time, it was thought to be extinct, and then they found some remnant specimens in some uh, Chinese um, uh, locations, temples, and they started propagating those, and now it's planted around the world. The unusual thing about the ginkgo is not only the age of, of how long it's been on this planet, but also it is the only species in its genus. And so very few, if any, insect disease problems uh, have, have evolved with this. Uh, tree. The last unusual tree that I wanted to show on our virtual tour of the Northeast Arboretum is the Japanese Emperor Oak. And I chose this uh, tree to represent our oak collection that we have. Uh, the unusual thing about this tree is just uh, the uniqueness of the availability. Uh, the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum is where I got this oak uh, species, but it's kind of difficult to find in the nursery tree. I hope you've enjoyed our virtual tour of the Northeast Arboretum. We gave you a quick look at some of the more unusual trees that we have growing out here at the Haskell Ag Lab. I encourage you to come out and visit the Arboretum spring, summer, fall, or winter. See what's growing out here and see what type of trees and plants you can incorporate in your landscape in northeast Nebraska. My name is Tom Hunt. I'm the entomologist at the Haskell Ag Lab. And today we're going to be looking at corn rootworm digging and raiding. This is digging the roots and raiding them. We do this on trials and uh, studies examining damage by rootworm, and we thought it'd be useful for you to see how we do this so that you can do this on your farm to evaluate if your oh, insecticide or rootworm transgenic is working. First of all is digging, of course. Look how we kind of, we put the shovel straight down. We don't want to be pruning the roots with our shovel. We try to get at least six inches away all around that root mass, pop that out of the ground like that. Kind of start knocking a bit of the dirt off. We're going to be cutting that stalk so that we can handle it easier, take it outside, outside the plot. 
Here you see some lodging that typically is the first thing you see, one of the first things that might give you a clue you have rootworm damage. In this case, we have pretty severe lodging in these plots. So root digging is important because in order to determine why we're getting lodging, exactly what contributes to the lodging, we need to dig that root mass. Here we have a root mass from a severely goosenecked plant. See how it's kind of growing and curving up out of the ground and kind of growing roots at upper nodes. So this is what we're digging. And then we'll throw them, pile them up. We usually get five per plant. We'll process them. We cut those stalks so it's handleable. Then we peel off some of those leaves, kind of get a nice stalk here. We'll do this for five plants per plot. Or if you're in the field, five plants or so per spot that you want to check. And here we are knocking some of the excess dirt off. We don't want to be hauling that around with us. It's heavy. And as you'll see later, we'll be cleaning the dirt off anyway. The goal is to get nice, clean roots. And here we see a rootworm beetle. One of the beetles that was doing that damage emerged as an adult, and that's the damage that rootworm beetles cause. It's called window painting. They scrape off the surface of the leaf there. They don't chew all the way through it, but just kind of scrape off the surface. And now we're getting them ready to take out of the plots. And as I said, we usually take five per plot, and we want to kind of hold them tightly together. You see a guy, he's trying to get them as tight as he can. Then we wrap them with duct tape. You want to wrap it good. These plants are going to be moved around. They're going to be soaked. They're going to be power washed. So you do want to get them tight, tightly wrapped and tightly taped. And then, of course, we do with a permanent marker, we'll label them um, first on one side and the other just to make sure we got them well labeled. We don't want that to wash off in the water either. So use a permanent marker when doing this. Now we're loading them up, pulling them out of the field. Notice how they're tightly wrapped, well labeled. So she'll put them in the truck, getting ready to take them to the first step in washing. And this is the first step. Usually we dig them, then we go take break or go eat lunch, and we have them soaking in a cow tank like this. And then we start washing them with a power washer. We want to get these perfectly clean. We got a nice stand here that Logan Dana built, I believe. He's our farm manager. And uh, so they're getting them really clean. Because if they don't get them clean, our raider, Keith Jarvie, will come back and make them clean them again. And I'll leave it here with Keith Jarvie. He was our IPM person and then turned extension educator, but he's got a lot of experience rating. So I'll turn this over to him. Well, hi, I'm Keith Jarvie. I'm a uh, emeritus entomologist and uh, extension educator for the University of Nebraska. And today I'm helping rate roots for corn rootworm damage and uh, people always want to know why do you have to do this well the, the only good way to know how severely your roots are damaged is by uh, doing a root rating and we've already done videos of uh, of the uh, digging and the washing process we've got all the dirt washed off of these roots now we're in the process of giving it a numerical rating based on feeding damage by the rootworm larvae okay it's a fairly simple scale it goes from zero to three a zero would mean that you have no damage whatsoever. Uh, uh, one means you would have one node pruned away from the plant. I'll show you that. You come on up and this plant has, has been rated already. It's drying out a little, but but you'll notice that normally we rate the three roots, of the three nodes at the bottom of the plant. Here's the first node. Here's the second node. And there's a third node. What we're doing is we're looking at roots that are, are pruned within an inch and a half or so of that main stock. That's considered a pruned root. And after that, you just say how many of these roots on these three nodes are pruned within an inch and a half. So uh, if you look at this root, this middle node is almost entirely pruned right down to the stock. So if you look at it, as you turn it around, those roots are almost all gone right down to the stock. Well, that makes it pretty easy. That's a one. One node is completely gone. So that would rate a one. Then you would go to the remainder and you look at some of these and you can see that these lower nodes are pruned. One, two, three, four, five. These aren't totally pruned to an inch and a half, so you don't count those. So about 1.5. So you know, we have about usually around 12 roots per node. And so if you had a six 
uh, six of these uh, extra roots pruned. That would be half a node. So we would end up rating this one and a half. Now I'm not counting the ones that are up here. So essentially, it's a it's a it's a damage based on the pruned roots. Now we'll see occasionally in a real severely damaged plant, you'll see that the plant will gooseneck. And this is really uh, when you have severe rootworm feeding damage, you have almost all the roots. The main node is gone. Uh, a big wind will come up, and that plant will just blow right over. And very quickly, uh, if there's especially if there's moisture on the ground. Even these upper nodes that normally are not touching the ground, once these touch the ground, they will start to try to form roots to compensate for that, the missing roots here. And even these roots that have been pruned very badly, they're going to start to, you know, they're going to start to regrow these roots. So even though you have rootworm damage, that plant will recover somewhat. And you'll notice that as you, as you, as I move back here, you'll notice that the plant is trying to go back vertical. Is trying to go back and get that sunlight to the leaves and so but you'll always have this goosenecking and uh, uh, the, the plant itself can compensate quite a bit sometimes for uh, if there's plenty of moisture and still good fertility that plant might still yield fairly well it'll never be a, a hundred percent of what it yields but it will compensate uh, uh, so you get a reduced yield from worm feeding also you get harvest difficulties it's really hard to get through a field where all the plants are goosenecked and crisscrossed just because it's gooseneck does not mean it's a rootworm problem. The only way you can figure out if it's a rootworm problem is to dig them and wash them and look at them. I'm Tom Hunt, the entomologist at the Haskell Ag Lab, and it's uh, about June 24th. And I just wanted to show you what a field looks like that has a significant gall midge, soybean gall midge population in it. What I'm going to show you here is kind of what you start to see this time of year if you've got those in your field. And it starts out on the edge, sometimes it stays on the edge, but this is pretty typical. If you look here, you can see several different kinds of damage. Like right here, see we have some plants that died very early. These probably got infested at about V late V2, V3 with enough larvae to kill them. And they died, you know, just probably around V5 or so before they got to V6. However, other plants get infested later or sometimes with just a few larvae. You get a lesion at the bottom and you see these these are these broken off plants like this one here these plants here these got up much higher as you can see they just broke off a few days ago a couple days ago but basically they get weak down at the base because of these midges here's another one fairly recent see a bit of a green stem and the leaves are turning brown but if you look at some of these here's a plant that probably would break off pretty easy you can see this lesion area down here Rip this open. Often you can see larvae, and there's one of those orange larvae. That's a third instar soybean gall midge larvae. And enough of getting that stem to cause this lesion all the way around, and it can just snap right off. I just wanted to show you what this is like, but sometimes you'll see this. This is the kind of thing that you can see sometimes just driving along the road. If you do see it, you've got significant gall midge, at least in the border there. Now this is the type of thing, it can be just an edge problem, a few rows in, or it can be 100 feet in or 200 feet in. You just have to check. In this case, we've been working in this field a couple years, so we've got gall midge pretty heavy here. Um, and that's my fault because I wanted to work on them. And Roger let me. So I thank farmers for letting me do this, particularly Roger Tunick. Um, and uh, I guess that's it for now. Hello everyone. My name is Mutukumamo. I'm a Nebraska Extension Educator in Cropping and Water Systems, located here at Haskell Ag Lab. Today, I am out here by a cover crop demonstration site, and uh, I would like to talk about what cover crops are and what their benefits to the soil are. Uh, cover crops have a lot of benefits uh, there is ample scientific evidence uh, supported by data to indicate that cover crops have plenty of uh, benefits to the health of the soil. Today I'm trying to intercede uh, cereal rye in corn. Today I'm just using um, a dry fertilizer spreader that Dr. Charles Shapiro used in the past. Uh, it's called the barber 
Basically, I filled that with cereal rye and calibrated it. And uh, I'm applying basically about 60 pounds, on average 60 to 63 pounds of cereal rye per acre. I'm here between two corn rows. Uh, this is uh, the part I have planted uh, cereal rye as a cover crop. Purpose of this is basically uh, to look at the effect of these cover crops on the soil compared to the part that's not uh, planted to cover crops. Usually to look at the effect, what we do is we will have a control where we haven't planted cover crop and then we have a section where we have put in the cover crops and every year uh, we will monitor what the soil structure looks like, what the organic matter content compared to the non-planted part and then I have uh, a collaboration with a uh, professor in Lincoln uh, in which uh, we're going to monitor the water that's leaching below the root zone by capturing and anal analyzing uh, and comparing basically the nutrient content of that water between uh, areas that are planted to cover crops and areas that are not planted to cover crops. So you have to weigh uh, the advantages and disadvantages when you look at uh, what cover crops to use, whether cover crop is beneficial to you or not. All in all, uh, from the literature, their benefit outweighs their uh, disadvantages. So if you have any questions, I'll be available to answer. Um, I can be reached at mmamo2 at unl.edu. Thank you. My name is Sarah Roberts, and I am the Learning Child Educator for Nebraska Extension, housed at the Haskell Ag Lab. As an early childhood educator, I provide professional development for educators and child care providers, as well as programming for children. I specialize in science and nature, and I am passionate about sharing this with my community. In addition to early childhood programming, we also have a strong 4-H presence led by our 4-H educator, Angela Apps. We look forward to bringing a program to a school, home, or youth event near you. In the meantime, check out this fun activity from ag educator, Megan Taylor. Hey everybody, it's Megan Taylor with Nebraska Extension and today you are going to be doing a nitrate kerplunk. And so today what we're going to do is we are going to demo, we're going to simulate how nitrogen and nitrate specifically, how that can leach through our soil profile. And all you need is a couple of cups, some tape, straws, paper, and a little bit of imagination. So we have our soil profile and what we're going to do is we are going to use uh, the straws to represent different moisture events or different extreme rainfall events. So what you're going to do is you're going to insert all the straws into your soil profile and it's going to create a web here. So all of our soil particles and our nitrate are going to sit on top of that. And so what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to actually demo is how rainfall our rainfall events, how subsequent rainfall events can affect leaching and how that can drive um, some nitrate loss. And so we're going to be doing this in a soil that is very coarse textured. So we're going to be uh, representing our, we're going to be representing a sandy soil. So it's going to be very coarse textured. 
So a coarse textured soil means that there's lots of room in between um, each of the actual particles, so there's a large pore space. So it doesn't hold water very well because water is going to be able to move through that very quickly. Where if it was a heavier textured soil like clay, they're going to be very tightly held together and it's going to be able to hold more water. Hence, it's going to have a little bit less leaching because nitrate is negatively charged and our soils are negatively charged as well. So, you know, negative and negative, they're going to repel one another. They're not going to be tightly held. And so that is why nitrate is so soluble and can move through the soil profile because when we have big flushes of rain or rain events, we're going to see that nitrate move down, especially in a coarse textured soil. It's going to move out very quickly because the water is going to move very quickly. And that's when we can see some leaching. So we're going to demo that now. Okay, so here's the final setup. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull the straws now. And every time we pull a straw, that is representing a rain event. And we're going to see how many rain events it would take for that nitrate to start show, showing leaching through our profile. So we're just going to keep pulling. And you can see that we're getting pretty close. Oop, lost a little bit of a soil particle. Ended up having two that were, came through. And so we had two uh, nitrate molecules that came through. And remember that each time that we were pulling a straw, that was representing a moisture event or an extreme rain event. So again, that was adding water into that coarse texture profile. And so that is why as we kept pulling the straw, so as we got more rain and more rain, it was going to move the nitrate down through the soil profile. So it took us nine poles to get there. You could do this with a variety of other uh, scenarios, but it works really well for explaining how nitrate moves and how leaching occurs. You could also do this where you had cards where you could either add straws back in if you had a best management practice that was going to help mitigate some of that loss. Uh, or if you were doing it based on farm practice. So the opportunities are endless with this. If you have more questions, if you design your own, if you want to try something new, please let me know. Uh, my contact information is mtaylor42 at unl.edu. And thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this year's virtual tour. We hope you will join us at our live session at 2 p.m. this afternoon for a chance to talk with and ask questions of our faculty about what you have seen today, as well as future projects. The link to register is go.unl.edu backslash how virtual tour. See you next year.